In the previous days, Siroji spoke about the seven Sambhojangas. These combined are the cause for Vipassana knowledge and the cause for path knowledge to arise. Or they are the supporting causes for a yogi who comes to know Vipassana knowledge and path knowledge. So if one wants to gain Vipassana knowledge and path knowledge, these factors are the strong support. If we want to possess Vipassana knowledge and path knowledge, we can't get it for nothing. So the causes for gaining this knowledge must be fulfilled. It won't happen without fulfilling these causes. When the causes are fulfilled, then there's no need to wish for anything to happen. The results will occur, arise naturally. The yogi's duty is simply to observe every arising object so that the mind is effectively observing the object. In Pali, it is said, yoniso manasikara, that means that one has to observe the object straight on. That means that for this type of observation to occur, there has to be ardent effort so that the mind reaches the object and aiming so that the mind has the object in focus. And with these, one will be able to observe effectively. So the objects arise on their own. There's nothing to think about there. There's no need for reflection. Just uh, observe what arises. And the teachers are urging the yogis uh, all the time to work like this. And one who follows the instructions that are given precisely realize they, the, such yogis can realize Vipassana knowledge within a few days. And within a short time, path knowledge can arise. There are some yogis with keen faith and desire to gain the results. And for those yogis who practice uh, sincerely, respectfully, the bojangas arise within a week or some within two weeks. For some yogis it takes three weeks and for some it takes four. If in one month the, these factors have not yet arisen, then it means that the yogi is not... So it means that the yogi is chronic. And that means it doesn't matter how long the yogi continues practicing. If the yogi hasn't been able to uh, gain these results in one month, they are chronic and continuing practice is not going to bring any results if they continue in the same way. The teachers are urging the yogis and the yogis must work at least 14 hours a day at sitting and walking. They have to work that many hours. And if a yogi doesn't work that many hours a day, then it means that the yogi does not want to become truly human. The yogi does not want to gain a truly humane heart and mentality, nor special knowledge that makes one a, a, a better than average human being. And if one practices in this ineffective way, then the next time one practices, it's going to be the same, no result. And 
it, next time, the same. Change to another method, it's going to be the same result. So in order that the remaining time be used as wisely as possible, effectively, before the talk, Sieroji wants to urge the yogis to follow the instructions and make use of your time. When do the bojangas arise? At the start of the practice, they haven't risen yet. First of all, one has to make the mind clean by observing the rising and the falling and other objects. And when, and when, one, and when one can observe the rising and falling well, still the bojangas haven't arisen yet. Although the mind is clean and there is citta visuddhi, still it hasn't arisen yet, the bojangas. And from here, from the stage of having the mind clean, when one reaches the stage of being able to, to distinguish between mind and matter, nama and rupa, the bojanga, bojangas still have not yet arisen. Further, when one can see how mind and matter is related as cause and effect quite well, still the bojangas haven't arisen yet. And when one sees how mind and matter, which are related as cause and effect, arise and then pass away, they are impermanent, suffering, and Selfless, still the bojangas have not yet arisen. It is only when one reaches the stage of Udhyabhyanyana, seeing the fast arising and passing away of phenomena, do the bojangas start to arise, and then they occur with stronger and stronger momentum. They are very apparent at the stage of Udhyabhyanyana. The yogi simply has to do as instructed, which is note at every arising, always guard the mind with vigilant mindfulness. Every time there is seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, bending, stretching, leaning, lifting the head, <coughs> lifting, moving, placing, blinking, opening and closing the eyes, in sitting, one has to start with observing the rising and the falling and observe whatever arises. In walking, one puts the attention on the lifting, the moving, and the placing. And yogis who work so as not to miss a single object, who try to observe all things that, that arise, such a yogi reaches Uriyabhyanyana, the stage of seeing the fast arising and passing away in a short time. And at that time, the dhammas, called the bojangas, occur amazingly with strong momentum. So some yogis have been here for more than a month now. And some yogis need to compare their experience with what Sayadaji has been saying in the talk. And they need to ask themselves, have I been practicing respectfully, meticulously, without taking breaks? Am I practicing so as not to miss even the small objects? Those who have good noting know when they catch the object exactly, and they also know when they miss. Careless yogis can't say, can't speak like this. There's bending and there's stretching. They can't say what they experience at those times. And here most yogis, the majority of yogis are in this category of not being able to observe effectively. 
uh, and it appears to Sierraji that most of the yogis uh, who are in this situation have practiced according to other methods previously, and that is affecting them. They aren't able to uh, take in the method of satipatthana effectively. And it's similar to when one wants to dye a piece of cloth. So if the old color remains, uh, in the, if the cloth already has been dyed some color, then you can't get a true color by dyeing it. You won't get the color that you want if that old color is still remaining. If you want to dye white cloth, it's very easy to get a good color. And you can also take the, dye, take the cloth that is already dyed and use dye remover to get the old dye out. And then it's easy to dye the cloth too. So if one doesn't remove the old color, that is to say if one doesn't uh, remove, put aside the old practice that one has done, uh, it won't be able to get a good color. So Sierraji has seen this before, and so he knows the situation. And he is here to help the yogis so that the correct color of the Dhamma emerges and he can help with this. It is very important for the yogis to be ready to receive this help. The Bojangas, which Sayadawji just mentioned, at what time do they arise? When does one come to know the Four Noble Truths? When the sati of vipassana that occurs together with vipassana knowledge and tamavijya are able to observe and know starting with the very small detailed objects. When virya has gone through the stages of initial effort the stepped up effort to overcome laziness, progressive effort which continues, increases stage by stage. This effort has momentum and has become pegaha, virya, the uplifting effort which doesn't drop down, it doesn't stagnate in the middle, it keeps on going, increasing steadily. And due to this, the observation becomes good. With good observation, there's joy, piti. One feels delighted. And it's peaceful, tranquil. Happiness also arises. This is what happens. And then the stability of samadhi and equanimity, all these factors become strong. And at this stage, there's no need to pay any special effort or to make any concerted effort to observe anything. One, one can, can just go along. And when one meets up with a good object, unlike before, there's not happiness, elation arising over it. When one meets up with a bad object, there's no opposition. The mind is equanimous towards whatever it encounters. It's impartial. So if that happens, if one reaches this stage, then very special things happen, and one knows the Four Noble Truths in a special way. So first of all, the yogis need to understand how the worldly truths are seen and known. Yogis who are noting well can observe one after another the objects that arise in their body. When there's matter that arises, they know this. 
when there's feelings, good or bad, the yogi knows the feeling. And the mind, when there's various types of mind that arise, the observing mind gets there first and knows that mind. And there's various types of actions, general objects, and the yogi too can catch all of these. So the sati is very well established, supatita. And because of this very firmly, very strongly established sati that is able to catch even the small details, the samadhi becomes very good. And observation becomes quite special. At this time, whatever one is able to observe is the truth of suffering, dukkha sancha. And the yogi is accomplishing the task according to the Buddha, dukkhang parinyayang. The truth of suffering is to be discerned and known. If one doesn't observe and know this truth of suffering, then one will see it as good and one will take pleasure in it. And, but on the other hand, by knowing the truth of suffering, as it arises, one is dispelling the cause. One is no longer taking pleasure in it because one is knowing and there is no place for the cause of suffering to arise. When our observation has momentum, as at this time, then the kilesas become very far removed from one's mind. This is called vikambana pahana. They are distanced. The kilesas are distanced. So the kilesas such as tanha, craving, they're far away. And sometimes the even, even the yogi thinks, there's no more kilesas left in me. There's nothing. So at this point, this mo- the momentary um, dispelling of kilesas is complete, tadanga pahana. And at this time, the, the bojanga dhammas occur. So if one analyzes what is happening in this moment, one is knowing the Four Noble Truths. When the object arises, every time the object arises, one observes it and knows it. And this is knowing the truth of suffering. Because one knows, one doesn't take pleasure in it. And therefore, the craving that would arise is dispelled. This is dispelling the cause of suffering, samudhiya sacha. And when we analyze this, in the moment of knowing the truth of suffering, there is knowledge. Therefore, ignorance, not knowing, cannot arise. One is knowing correctly and therefore craving does not arise. Craving doesn't, doesn't arise, tana doesn't arise, and therefore clinging, strong tana, does not arise. And the wrong view, wrong view such as the view of self, is not there. Avijja, not knowing, tana, craving, and upadana, clinging, These are called the cycle of kilesas. And this cycle of kilesas has come to a stop. This is called vivata in Pali. And because the cycle of kilesas has come to a stop, there are no actions performed based on the kilesas. There are no actions which would lead to further good lifetimes and no unwholesome actions. Because there is no kama, good or bad, being created, there is also no results, no no cycle of results happening, vipaka. And therefore, the three cycles have come to an end. 
Kilesa Vata, the cycle of Kilesas, has stopped. It is eliminated. The Kama Vata, the cycle of actions or Kama, also has stopped. And also the cycle of results. Because these have all come to have ceased, they have come to sense cessation. This is called Tadanga Niroda. So three of the truths are being accomplished if we analyze, because one is knowing, dispelling, and realizing. One is knowing the truth of suffering, dispelling its cause, and realizing this cessation. And analyzing what is uh, in the mind at this point, the path factors of sila, morality, are all present, and they are removing the gross forms of kilesas. The path factors of samadhi are present, and they are removing the kilesas that obsess in the mind. The panya, path factors of panya, wisdom, are present and they are, they are removing the very seeds of the kilesas. So there's complete removal of the kilesas at this moment by the, all the factors of the path. And every time the yogi observes the arising object, these factors, these factors of the path are involved. So by observing the truth of suffering, one dispels its cause. Cessation is realized and the path to cessation is being developed. These happen automatically. And this is on the worldly level in, in terms of the worldly truths. By knowing the truth of suffering, the three other tasks are accomplished of dispelling, realizing, and developing. So it's four at a blow. And therefore the Four Noble Truths are all, are all being accomplished and realized at the moment of observation. At the moment of Vipassana, when Vipassana knowledge arises, then it's as when light arises and darkness is dispelled. The cause of suffering, samudhya satcha, and all the other kilesas have no chance to arise. And when one uh, continues to observe one, uh, one's observation has momentum, and the kilesas, <clears throat> the kilesas are dispelled by being distanced quite far away, vikambana. The, v, <clears throat> the prefix in vikambana means that the kilesas are not only separated, but very far removed. But they're not completely cut off at this point. It is only when path knowledge arises that the roots of the kilesas can be cut off. For example, when one has a fever such as malaria, one has to take a medicine to control the fever, to reduce the fever. But the cause for the fever still remains in one's body and one needs to one, one, by controlling the fever, one is no longer going to die of it. But one still has to eliminate the cause by taking further medicine. And it's similar with the kilesas. The kilesas which have followed us throughout our lifetimes are the same way. We have to Take, like we have to take medicine to make the fever go down and then to eliminate the fever completely. When Vipassana knowledge is arising, 
when, when it becomes complete, then one goes from seeing pavata, which is the continual stream of mind and matter, mental, physical phenomena, to apavata, the cessation of this. At that point, the kilesas are cut off completely. So this is this type of dispelling, cutting off, is samocheda pahana, um, removing by cutting them off. And when one realizes the removal of the kilesas to to some extent like this, then one becomes very happy, and one understands that this is truly something to rely on. One has gained. The, uh, the Dhamma, which is a true refuge. And one understands because of the practice that was done, one gained this sure refuge. And although one doesn't, one is no longer able to meet the Buddha in person, one comes to know in one's mind who this person was who taught the Dhamma they understand that this Buddha was really a true teacher. And one also comes to understand that there are people in the world who have dispelled the kilesas, uprooted the kilesas to various degrees. So uh, as to some degree, to a greater degree, even greater degree, and some, there are some in the world who have removed them completely. So, so first one comes, in, in this process, first of all, one comes to know the virtues of the Dhamma. And without being urged to, uh, one knows automatically because uh, when knowledge arises through the practice, one comes to know the virtues of the Dhamma. And when one's knowledge is fulfilled, one goes from pavata, the endless stream of mind and matter, to apavata, to the cessation of this. And then one dispels the relevant kilesas, the kilesas that are related to that path knowledge. And at that time, one is knowing the truth of suffering, dispelling what is to be dispelled, and developing what is to be developed. So these, the four functions are complete. The four um, the functions involved with the Four Noble Truths are complete. At this time, it is because one realizes Nibbana that the other three tasks of, of knowing, dispelling, and developing are accomplished. Before before one reaches this stage, it is through seeing the truth of suffering that the other three tasks are accomplished. And this realization of the process of developing knowledge and realizing Nibbana is like what happens in an office. In an office, the underlings do the work and when even though their work is done the task the whole thing is not finished until the boss signs off on the project and signing it only takes a moment because all the work has been accomplished by the workers and then it's legal one sees Nibbana and at the same time the truth of suffering is known, its cause is dispelled, and the path is being developed. So if the work of the workers is not complete, then the boss can't sign off on the project. So when vipassana knowledge is not complete, path knowledge does not arise. And the yogis have to understand this. There are two parts to meditation practice, and uh, it, one needs to understand this. 
There's the worldly part of the practice and there's the supra-mundane part of the practice. In the worldly part of the practice, what one has to do is to observe the truth of suffering when every arising object needs to be observed. So in this, when there is knowledge, then there won't be any uh, going for the good objects or pushing away the bad ones. And there won't be any ignorance at this time. And there won't be any type of kama that brings about results. So the the results also will not be arising. So there will, there will not, at this time, one is doing the task, uh, accomplishing the task that needs to be accomplished in the worldly part of the practice, which is to see the truth of suffering, and by doing that, to remove it, the remaining three tasks are automatically being accomplished. But the project, the work as a whole, is not done yet. One is doing the work, but the work is not done. When one realizes Nibbana, by seeing the truth of Nibbana, then the remaining tasks are accomplished. The truth of suffering is discerned, known clearly. Its cause, the truth of suffering, is dispelled. Is the truth of the cause of suffering is dispelled and the truth of the path is being developed. So at that time, uh, you, one can say, well, there's the work and the task to be accomplished. There's doing the work and the task to be accomplished. And what is very important now is for the yogi to be working without a break 20 hours a day. So there's 24 hours in a day. And we take away four hours for sleep. So there are 20 20 hours left. And of that 20 hours that are left, there should be seven hours of sitting and seven hours of walking. That makes 14, where the yogi needs to be working full time. And uh, 20 minus 14 is six. This remaining six hours is for eating and washing and going from one place to another and so on. So altogether there's 24 hours and in 20 hours uh, one has to be actively observing. So the yogis have to work a full 14 hours at sitting and walking. and. If one is not working a full 14 hours, or if one is not working meticulously, then it will not be very easy to gain the Dhamma. When one has a method which brings the result of elevating the standard of human life, then one shouldn't be afraid for one's body. One shouldn't be afraid that disease is going to arise. One shouldn't be afraid for one's life that one is going to die. To date, there have been no diseases incurred due to the practice, and there have been no deaths that occurred. Instead, people have gained health through doing the practice. If we have a method for elevating our life, then in applying that we should not have consideration for one's life or limb. It is said, kāye ca jīvite ca anapakata upata peti. One should not feel sorry for one's body. One should not have 
regard for one's body or for one's life in doing the practice. 